Right. Um, good evening and welcome, everybody. It's um, wonderful to see a full house, indeed possibly slightly more than full house. Um, and I know that there could have been um, many more people here um, if, we had, um, if the theatre was bigger. Um, so you're all very welcome um, here to LSE. My name's John Hills. Um, I'm co-director of the new LSE International Inequalities Institute, which is hosting this evening's lecture. Um, this is, in fact, our third. We, we started on the 1st of May. Um, this is actually our third event under the auspices of the new institute. Um, we were lucky enough to have Tony Atkinson um, launching his new book um, on the 30th of April, the day before we started. In fact, that, that is available as a podcast um, on the LSE events website. Um, the, um, we had a symposium last week with Tom R. Piketty um, talking about different aspects of his book, Capital in the 21st Century. Um, that, I, from the sequence on the LSE events website, I think that will probably be available in the next couple of days um, in a series of four um, video casts um, of that. Um, I'm delighted to be um, welcoming um, Professor Joseph Stiglitz to the LSE this evening. Um, I first came across um, uh, his work um, as a student in the um, 19, um, early, late 1970s, the lectures on public economics um, with Tony Atkinson. Um, he was, as you, I think all of you, having queued for tickets or having used very quick fingers on the website to get here, um, know all about his work. He was chief economist at the World Bank. Um, he's a university professor at Columbia. Um, at the moment, um, he was, of course, um, and, and he's chair um, of um, the Brooks World Poverty Institute um, up in the University of Manchester, and of course, he won the Nobel Prize in 2001. Um, he is the author of not only a very large number of academic contributions, um, but also his best-selling books um, on um, globalization and discontents, on the Roaring Nineties, um, on free fall and the book he talked about when he was last talking to us, um, The Price of Inequality. Um, and just in the last few days, I think, um, he's published um, uh, the, from the Roosevelt Institute in the US, available online, um, Rewriting the Rules of the American Economy, an Agenda for Growth and Shared Prosperity. And I think maybe, I hope you may say something about that um, this evening. Um, so what he's going to be talking about this evening is his new book, new to us, um, um, The Great Divide, um, which is a collection of his writing over the last um, three or four years, focused in particular on the crisis, on the response to the crisis, and on, of course, inequality. And this evening he's going to be focusing within the huge range um, that the book covers. He's going to be talking about inequality, um, different aspects of it, and I hope touching on um, policy um, towards it. Um, now, can I say, please, can you turn mobile phones to at least silent? Um, if you are tweeting, uh, the hashtag is hashtag LSE Stiglitz. Um, so, Only um, favorable comments, no, no, no <laughs> criticisms. Uh, there will probably be a, a kind of compilation of them put, to, put together afterwards. I'm not sure whether these things are censored, um, <laughs> but I'm sure the comments will all be uh, favorable. Um, I should say that um, after, the, after he's given his lecture, um, there will, as usual, be um, a chance for, question, uh, for questions and answers. Um, I hope um, we'll, um, I'm sure there'll be many of you who'll be wanting to, to put questions um, to him. Um, and then there will be a chance, um, uh, those of you who have copies of the book and would like it signed, there will be, I think, for a short period, um, Joe is prepared to, to sign that. Um, but um, uh, it's my huge pleasure on behalf of um, LSE and the International Inequality Institute to welcome you to talk about uh, the Great Divide. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here again. Uh, my own interest in, in the subjects of inequality really uh, began with 
uh, growing up in Gary, Indiana, which uh, some of you may know is uh, an industrial town, or was an industrial town, uh, on the southern sh uh, shores of Lake Michigan. In a way, it was the, it reflected the quintessential history of industrialization in the United States. It started in 1906 uh, as the largest integrated steel mill, and uh, it, uh, it, was a, it was really a company town, so much so that the name Gary uh, comes after the chairman of the board of U.S. Steel. So you can't be much more corporate uh, than that. Um, but then uh, it, 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 it flourished with industrialization. Uh, and then as America became deindustrialized, de it's now become uh, a wasteland. Uh, they make movies there. Uh, uh, it's a little bit safer than, than Somali. So if you want to make a movie about Somaliland and, and fighting, you can look at the devastation there and it gives you a feeling without having all the, uh, without ha having all the, the, the backdrop uh, of, uh, of being blown up. Uh, just a few gang wars that you might have to face as you uh, make your movie. Well, uh, as I was growing up, uh, what I saw was uh, high levels of uh, inequality, uh, much of it related to r racial discrimination, and uh, episodic unemployment. My, uh, the parents of my, of my classmates were uh, frequently, every two, three, four years, uh, uh, unemployed because of business cycle, and then uh, episodic strikes, the civil strike. So I hadn't realized when I was uh, growing up that this was the golden age of capitalism. Uh, that this was as good as it got, and that, of course, is the, one of the major messages of the of of uh, Thomas's Piketty's book that you uh, uh, talked about uh, last week. Uh, and one of the topics I'm going to be talking about is uh, uh, why was that the golden age? What happened after that? But it wasn't actually that golden, as as I'll try to explain uh, a little bit later. Uh, I wrote my thesis at MIT. Uh, on the subject of uh, inequality. Uh, inequality has not, as many of you may know, not been a fashionable subject within economics. In fact, uh, Bob Lucas uh, wrote a famous uh, uh, a speech, an article. Uh, Robert Way quoted it in one of his articles about saying that something to the effect that of all the subjects in economics, the most poisonous to talk about was inequality. So it was, it was uh, a subject that not only was not discussed, it was viewed with uh, considerable hostility. And if we have time, I can come back and uh, explain that hostility, but obviously there was a, uh, a political dimension to that. Uh, but I, uh, I decided that this was, this was the reason why I switched out when I was in college from majoring in physics, which I thought I was going to do uh, my life's work, and went into uh, economics because I thought these problems, the social problems, were so much more important. Well, that led to my PhD thesis, uh, which an abbreviated version of which was published in Econometrica. Uh, and uh, I still think, uh, as I reread it, uh, it was uh, really good. And, <laughs> and, and, and uh, uh, I think really more people should, should, should read it, and I'm encouraging you. Uh, but uh, uh, a, a few years ago, uh, I was asked by uh, Vanity Fair to write an article about inequality. Uh, and I wrote an article uh, that uh, did get a lot more attention. So the, the moral of the story for, for th those of you who go into academia, uh, if you want readership, uh, Vanity Fair is better than Econometrica. <laughs> uh, the title of uh, that book summarizes a lot about what, the, the title of that article summarizes a lot about what this book is about. Uh, the title of that article was Of the 1%, For the 1%, and By the 1%. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, a lot about American history, and which I assume is most of you having, uh, uh, the, the, in the middle of the U.S. Civil War between North and South, uh, there is a famous speech called the Gettysburg Address that every American kid has to learn, and it was uh, Lincoln's address to try to explain uh, what this whole war was about, and what he 
said was uh, this was a war about seeing whether government of the people, for the people, and by the people uh, will survive. And so I made uh, a paraphrase of that and to say, that, well, uh, it hasn't survived. We have a new form of government uh, of the 1% for the 1% and by the 1%. And uh, that tells you a lot about why there is this inequality. It's not just economic forces. It's the way our policies and politics uh, have played out. And so what I want to do uh, in, in this very limited amount of time is go through, first, describe very quickly uh, the various dimensions of inequality. Uh, and as I say, some of this, given that you've had a couple of talks, uh, should be a matter of review. Um, I talked about some of these uh, issues uh, last time I was here, but uh, some of the things have gotten worse since then. Um, they, and and um, then go on to, to some of the, what I view as major changes in our understanding in, uh, in the nature of inequality. Um, so there's been enormous growth in inequality. That's why it's getting so much attention now. Uh, and this is true especially in the United States, which has uh, more inequality than any of the other advanced countries. But un uh, unfortunately, countries that have followed the US model, and uh, unfortunately, uh, UK is among those countries. Uh, in fact, they call it sometimes the Anglo-American mo model. They have also shown an increase in inequality. And you'll hear from the government occasionally, well, things are better in the last uh, two hours or the last three years. Uh, but uh, that's a too narrow lens to look, look at what is going on in the world. Uh, you have to see things in, in, a, in broader terms. So there are multiple dimensions of inequality. Uh, there's uh, more money at the top. And just to give you a flavor of what's happened in the United States, uh, in the period uh, three years after the end of the Great Recession, you know, the administration and the Federal Reserve announced the end of the recession in 2009, 91% of all the increase in income went to the top 1%. Uh, and that meant uh, for most Americans, for the 99%, there was no end of the recession. Uh, and it, it really illustrates the, the great divide, the, the, the uh, differences in the directions in which our economy has been going. Uh, there are more people in poverty. There's been an evisceration of the middle. And uh, by that, I mean not only um, have, has there been uh, stagnant income in the middle, but it's also the case that uh, there are fewer people, say, plus or minus uh, 50% of, of median income. And just to show you some, some numbers to, to, to illustrate uh, what is uh, the, these things, uh, uh, this is a chart I'm sure you've seen uh, in your previous uh, discussions of what's happened to the top 1%, uh, that it was very high right before the Great Depression, then came down, and that period in the 50s uh, that I was growing up is this low period where the golden age of capitalism, and then it's gone back, uh, way, way back up. So the top 1% is getting between 20 and 25% uh, of the income. And, um, you know, there are various metrics that reflect the same thing. Uh, a number that I find very, very startling is the fact that uh, uh, median income in the United States uh, today is actually lower than it was a quarter century ago. Uh, what that says is that for most Americans, the economy has not increased, not given them benefits for a quarter of a century. But things are even worse when you look at the bottom, uh, the, um, or if you look at uh, various demographic groups. Uh, you know, the, the median income is, 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 is an average for all different demographic groups, and one demographic group that I have some uh, sympathy for are, is males. And uh, the median income of a full-time male worker is lower today than it was 40 years ago. So if you want to understand some of the disillusionment, some of the anger that you see in, in uh, American uh, Men, uh, 
Uh, it, it is the fact that they've, you know, they were told every generation was going to do better, and they've had 40 years, almost two generations, of decline. Uh, the, um, the things at the bottom are even worse. The minimum wage, the wage that people, you know, at the bottom get in the United States, is lower than it was uh, 45 years ago. So basically, there's been a half century of no pay increase for those uh, at the bottom. Now, from my point of view, uh, an economic system that doesn't deliver for most of its citizens is a failed economic system. And so this issue, this debate about inequality, is also a discussion about whether our economic system really is working. And if it's not working, why it's not working? And I'll come back uh, and talk about that uh, a little bit later. So um, there's been, the, not a, as I say, more money at the top, more people in poverty, evisceration in the middle. Um, there are a number, a number of other dimensions of inequality. There are inequalities in wealth exceed those in income. And again, a, a simple number just ca encapsulates a lot of what's going on. There are eight Americans who have inherited their wealth, so it's not from hard work. Uh, they made an important decision. Uh, as one of my friends, uh, billionaires, uh, says, they won the sperm bank, and uh, the sperm lottery, and, and they, they had the right father. And uh, so these, the, these eight Americans from two families have as much wealth as the bottom 44% of all Americans, which is testimony to how much money is there top and how little money there is at the bottom. Uh, I can go on and tell you how bad these two families are, but I won't. Uh, uh, you know, they, they've gotten their money, at least one of them, from exploiting poor people, exploiting workers, minimum wage workers, exploiting the political system. Uh, there are inequalities in health, and this is, of course, especially large in the United States where, where we don't, haven't had a, a public health system. Uh, we haven't had access to public health, and, and you see enormous inequalities. And those at the bottom of the United States, say the women who don't graduate from high school, which is just a, a way of care, have had a decline in life expectancy greater than that's going on in Russia. Uh, it's got down by several years. And, uh, you know, you, you, you know a, a health crisis. Um, and there's even inequality in access to justice. I have one essay in, in, in this volume where I talk about this inequality in access to justice. Uh, young Americans, every day, we have this ritual of where we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag. It's a very peculiar, anyway, I won't say. It's a, you go through this, this ritual, pledging the allegiance to the flag. And then, as that pledge of allegiance goes on, there's a phrase that says, uh, with justice for all. But actually, if you, uh, look at what's happened, we now ought to be amending that Pledge of Allegiance to say, with justice for all who can afford it, uh, which is, of course, uh, those who have money. And, and we saw that very clearly in the crisis where our, our, our uh, justice system, our so-called justice system, was throwing people out of their homes who didn't owe any money. The banks were lying to the courts and saying that they had inspected, signing affidavits that they had verifying that they, these individuals owed money when in fact they had not verified and many of these individuals did not owe money. The courts gave total deference to, 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 to the banks. The poor individuals couldn't afford a lawyer and there was no court appointed lawyer and they were just thrown out of their homes. And the irony is that none of the banks bank officials who lied, and when I say lied, by the thousands, these were, you know, perjury, thousands and thousands of times saying, these people owed us money, none of them have been held accountable. No one went, uh, 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 was brought to justice. So th these are all examples of dimensions of, inequal uh, of, of inequality in, in our um, uh, society. Um, but the most invidious aspect I think of inequality is something that Americans think of part of their self-identity and many people 
uh, think of part of, of America's identity, which is equality of opportunity. People talk about it as the American dream. And there are people who make it from the bottom to the middle and bottom to the top. Very talented immigrants uh, are successful. But what we mean, but what economists or social scientists mean by equality of opportunity are what are the probabilities? What does the mobility matrix look like? What are the correlations between the ch children and their parents? And uh, in those terms, America is among the countries with the least equality of opportunity. Uh, that is to say, a young American's life prospects are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in other advanced countries. So I tell my students, you know, there's only one important decision you have uh, to make in life, and that is choosing the right parents. <laughs> and after you, if you mess up on that, you know, the game is over. Um, this kind of inequality in opportunity is not a surprise. There's now a large body of research talking about the systematic relationship between inequalities in incomes and inequalities in, uh, inequality in outcomes and inequality of opportunity. And, uh, you know, I don't have time to go through it. I talk about some, uh, some of that in, in the book about, but what are the relationships? The most important aspect has to do, obviously, with access to education. And that's particularly true in the United States where we have a locally based education system, locally controlled, locally financed. But it's true in other countries where there, there has been uh, this local, because uh, local education, because where you live depends on your parents' income. And if your income is low, you live in a poor neighborhood and you go to schools that are underfunded and, and poor. The problem in the United States has been getting worse, and I don't know this data for other countries, maybe uh, some other people here will know, but one of the things that's happened in the United States, we have now data uh, just come out in the last couple of years, showing America has become a more economically segregated country, which means that uh, rich people live more and more in proximity with rich people and poor people poor people with poor people. And that means as we become more economically segregated, more separated, the great divide in terms of income spatially has increased, it means that those who uh, come from uh, uh, poor families are more likely to live in poor communities and have less of an economic opportunity. Um, this just shows the, uh, an example of looking across countries, the correlation in a, in a graph between inequality in income and mobility, uh, uh, what, what, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, likelihood of increasing your income. And what you see, not surprisingly, is countries like uh, Den the, the Scandinavian countries have the highest level of mobility, and uh, there is a systematic relationship between the two. The interesting research that's been done in the United States looking across counties and showing that counties with more inequality of income and outcomes uh, have uh, lower equality of opportunity. What I want to do now is, is uh, spend a few minutes talking about some of the changes in our uh, understanding of um, inequality, uh, and this is more in a theoretical sense, uh, but in, in terms of the data, uh, over the last, um, uh, the last uh, five years or so. Um, the first uh, uh, change is, uh, I, I hardly, uh, I, I don't even list it on, the, on these slides, is the rejection of trickle-down economics, because in some sense, uh, there was never any good theory or empirical evidence. Trickle-down economics was that if you threw enough money at the top, uh, everybody would gain. Um, as I already mentioned, we've thrown a lot of money at the top. You saw how the top was doing, and you saw the stagnation in the middle. And uh, the stagnation at the bottom. So clearly trickle down uh, 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 hasn't worked. Interestingly, uh, both the Obama administration and the Federal Reserve tried trickle down economics in spite of the fact that it had not worked for 
decades, tried it as a method of recovering from the crisis. So if you notice what the, what the Obama administration did is, you know, we allocated $700 billion, and I just don't know what your background is, but I just want you to know, $700 billion is a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, we allocated $700 billion and for the recovery. Uh, and, and then, the, uh, actually, I was on, on uh, um, uh, a conference where, uh, when the, right after Lehman Brothers uh, broke, uh, you know, and, and the crisis, you know, it was, was steaming up, and, and the Bush administration had uh, uh, proposed uh, uh, a major bailout of, of $700 billion. Um, you know, the question is, how did they choose $700 billion? Uh, they thought a trillion dollars was, uh, would scare people. So they wanted, what is the largest number lo smaller than a trillion dollars that looks like it's smaller? And they said 700 billion. That's the fine calculation of policy analysis uh, that was done. So I was on the uh, conference uh, trying to decide what was the Democratic response to this. What would Obama do? Obama was already the candidate and, uh, you know, had uh, uh, this meeting, it was over a conference call, mostly uh, bankers, not a surprise, and then a few other people. And um, the bankers' response was, why did you limit it to $700 billion? Uh, you know, why are you so cheap? Uh, you know, we need more money. Well, we might need more money. And uh, basically, I said, well, you know, you ought to be trying not just trickle-down economics, throwing the money at the banks. You know, let's try to help people who are being thrown out of their homes. And they, basically, the bankers booed me down and said, uh, and then, and then uh, the interesting thing is that uh, Obama then supported the Bush initiative for the bank bailout, and a couple billion dollars a couple billion out of 700 billion was allocated to homeowners, and then they didn't spend it. And they set rules that, that mo ensured that most people weren't eligible. So it was an experiment in trickle-down economics, another experiment of trickle-down economics that failed. The QE, quantitative easing monetary policy, tried another example of that. What they said is, we'll lower interest rates, and what was the basic philosophy of this? And I'll come back to if I have time to talk about it later. What was the basic philosophy? You lower interest rates and you create a stock market bubble. You make the rich richer and maybe they'll spend a little bit more money. <laughs> and then everybody will benefit. So the Fed tried trickle-down economics. It had a little effect. I don't want to say nothing. It had a big effect increasing inequality. It was right that it created a stock market bubble. And the 1% recovered their wealth very quickly. The 99% still have not recovered. Well, uh, the, uh, uh, the change in our understandings of inequality uh, that I want to talk about, I want to begin with the repeal of Kuznick's law. Um, Kuznick's great Nobel Prize winner, who, uh, one of the originators of the national income statistics, talked about this plausible story of why inequality would first rise in the early stages of, devel uh, of development and then would fall. And the idea was very simple. As, as the economy uh, starts to develop, some parts of the economy are more able to take advantage of the new opportunities and they pull out. But then as the economy grows, those that are behind catch up. And so the idea was that, that inequality would fall. And we saw, if you remember the chart I showed about what happened after uh, 1920, 19, you know, 1940, uh, inequality fell and fell dramatically, and consistent with Kuznick's, who was writing in the 1950s. Now he thought it was, you know, he didn't call it a law, but other people uh, gave it the name law. Well, what we now know, and this was really brought out very forcefully by uh, uh, Piketty's work, was that uh, after 1980, inequality started to rise again. So the question is, something was peculiar about this period between 19, say, the end of World War II and 1980. And, and uh, the question is, what, what 
uh, what, uh, what was the reason for this. Uh, one interpretation was that inequality is the natural state of capitalism. Uh, and that's basically the, the view that Piketty takes. It's the natural state of capitalism. And there was an aberration after World War II having to do with the high degree of social cohesion that the war brought about. And there were lots of peculiar things. Uh, that period, just to f frame it, was the period of the fastest economic growth, not only in the United States, but in Western Europe. It was the period of shared prosperity. Every group in our country grew, but the vote, those at the bottom grew more rapidly. So everybody participated, but inequality came down in a significant uh, way. Uh, we had peculiar things like top marginal tax rates. When we were growing the fastest, let me remind you, growing the fastest, top marginal tax rates in the United States was 91%. Now, if you listen to current governments, both in the United States and the UK, you would believe that a 91% top marginal tax rate, entrepreneurship would have totally disappeared. The economy would have gone down the tubes, to use an American colloquialism. Uh, it didn't happen. In fact, as I said, the economy grew very rapidly. So there were many things that were distinctive about this period. And, um, so one interpretation was that uh, this eventually, by 1980, the sense of social cohesion had evaporated, and we were going back to the natural state of capitalism. In a way, that is the perspective of Piketty. There's another interpretation, and I'm going to argue very strongly for that, that the increase in inequality after 1980 was a result of a change in policies. Uh, a whole raft of changes of policies, not just one thing, but a, but a whole constellation. And uh, I'll try to talk about what some of those uh, changes were. But one way of thinking about the, let me put it in the American perspective, uh, the, the, the philosophy was very clear, and it was Reagan who articulated this here and Thatcher in, in the UK. Um, case of the United States, uh, the view was we're going to lower the top tax rate way, way down to 35, 30 percent, and we're going to strip away all the regulations. And the two things together are incentivizing and liberalizing, freeing up the economy, and that will result in faster economic growth. They recognized, I think, that it would lead to more inequality. Had to. But they said the economy would grow so much faster that the size of the piece that those in the middle and the bottom get would actually get bigger. So in economist jargon, it was a prey to improvement. Everybody would be better off. Some people would be more better off than others. But let's put aside the politics of envy. Everybody would be better off. Well, it didn't work out that way. They were right about one prediction. It did lead to more inequality, uh, even more than they probably uh, had advertised. But I some what happened in you know the subsequent third of a century. The bottom 90% of America saw no increase in their income. And all the increase in GDP went to the top. So I sometimes say, you know, put yourself back in, in history and assume that Reagan had ha come, or anybody had come to the American people and say, I have a deal for you. I have a new economic policy, uh, a new set of rules and regulations, frameworks, a whole set of brilliant ideas, and uh, the care, what it's going to do for you is ensure that you will see no increase in your income for the next third of a century, <laughs> and all the increase of income is going to go to the top 10 percent. Now, would the American people probably in a democratic society have voted for that wonderful deal? <laughs> I don't think so, but that was the deal that we got. But we didn't get it by a vote on that issue. That wasn't what was said. We were promised something different from what we got. And one of the themes 
is that it's our policies that has gotten, uh, gotten us to where we are. And the policies have been a, an accretion, you know, step by step, nothing dramatic, no major change. I mean, there, there were big changes under Reagan, but most of what's happened is a step by step change in the rules of the game, the policies of tax policy, expenditure policies, monetary policy, every aspect of our economy and our society in ways that cumulatively have led to what I view as disastrous outcomes. And that's why we've begun a campaign, which it was referred to, is rewriting the rules, rewriting the underlying institutions, regulations that define our economy. So that's this, um, he, he was showing you the uh, executive summary. This is the whole report, uh, which is somewhat uh, uh, heavier. And uh, we re, uh, uh, released it uh, last week in, in Washington at a big event where, where uh, Elizabeth Warren spoke, Mayor uh, de Blasio spoke. Uh, we, we met with uh, Clinton's people. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it's, we're trying to define the agenda going forward, uh, a little bit less timid agenda than some people in the Labor Party defined here in the UK, with the hope that uh, a, a, a clear vision of an alternative will uh, 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 receive uh, a lot more attention than a more timid policy. And so far, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been working. Um, as I said, I believe very strongly that the, the uh, underlying, uh, what's underlying is not the under, fundamental nature of capitalism, but it is the policies, some of which actually are, I think, contrary to what we really mean by a market economy. Sometimes I label this as ersatz capitalism, a fake capitalism. When you, bail, when you, when you uh, have a system where you uh, socialize losses and privatize gains, that's not a market economy. That's a, sort of a fake market economy. But as we look across countries, we see large differences in outcomes among the advanced countries. Why that's so important is suggest that it is policies, not economic forces that are at play. The, the, the underlying forces of technology, globalization, are similar in all the advanced countries. It's not like the same, you know, technology is just limited to one country. Technology is basically universal. Same thing about globalization. Basically, we all face the same global rules. But how that gets shaped by our economy, by our society, by our politics is very markedly different. And that is why there are such different outcomes, both in e inequalities in income, wealth, and opportunity. And that leads to the view that I uh, uh, repeat over and over again in this book that inequality is a choice. It's a result of how we structure the economy through tax and expenditure policies, through our legal frameworks, our institutions, even the con conduct of monetary policies. And with this, all, all of these affect market power. You know, economists don't like to talk about power. And that's because the basic model that's taught to you in your first undergraduate course, the basic framework is the competitive model, the competitive equilibrium model. And that begins with the assumption that no one has market power. But we know that's not true. Or at least we should know that's not true. Who are some of the richest people in the world? Bill Gates, Carlos Slim, they made their money not in competitive markets. They made their money from the exercise of monopoly power. If you ask the question, why is it that African Americans are so disadvantaged relative to others? It's not or women relative to men. It's not just the inexorable workings of markets, of competitive markets. It has to do with the exercise of political market, uh, political and economic uh, power. Uh, the rules of the game affect the conditions under which workers can engage in collective bargaining, or the threat of firms moving abroad, outsourcing, 
affects the bargaining power of workers. At the microeconomic scale, you know, the bargaining power of workers and firms are distinctly different. And just to give you a couple examples of, of, how, of how the rules of the game can shape market power, in the United States, we had a, a health care system that was employer-based. You got your health care through your employer. And we had a system where the insurance companies would not cover you for what was called a pre-existing condition. That means if you're on the job, I mean, if you have one employer, and you discover that you have a problem, like a cancer, <laughs> then no other insurance company would insure you. And that meant you had to stick with your existing employer. And that meant your existing employer, who knew that, had total power over you. You couldn't leave if he, you know, if he didn't give you a pay raise, or if, even if he cut your pay raise, if he mistreated you, you had no opportunity. If we design a system of transportation that poor people can't get to the jobs very easily, there are fewer jobs that are accessible that affects the number of firms that they can access. That affects market power. So all our trade rules, all our, you know, all our expenditure policies, all of these cumulatively affect the market power. What is going on right now in the United States is a big debate about trade policy. The reason that there's such opposition to it is that we are rewriting the rules, but unfortunately, we're not rewriting the rules to balance the system. We're rewriting the rules to give more power to corporations. And if you look at the legal system that is embedded in that trade agreement, it's a legal system which is unfair. It, it, it represents a deviation from what most of us would call the rule of law in equal access to justice. So maybe in the question period we'll, we'll go through this, but, but that's an example of how step by step, brick by brick, we create a more un unequal society. Monetary policy, how does monetary policy play in? Well, if you have it in a, mo a central bank that focuses on inflation, and whenever they say, we can see the wide of the eyes of inflation, that was the expression they would use, they would raise interest rates. What would that do? Well, every time we have a recession, wages go down. Wages go down relative to prices. And so, so real wages go down. We can see this. And then what happens when recovery, the economy recovers, so wages start to go up. The moment wages start to go up, before they get back to where they were before the, the recession, they raise interest rates to create more unemployment. If you have higher unemployment, obviously the bargaining power of workers is weakened. So this has resulted in a ratchet effect of wages successfully getting weaker and weaker. Well, uh, all of this means that what is at stake here is not just a question of redistribution. You know, sometimes people who say we're concerned about inequality, all the discussion is about redistribution. Our focus, the argument in this book is that it's really about the distribution of income, wealth, before taxes and transfers. How our economic system creates market power that leads some people to be better off and other people to be worse off. There's some other changes in our understanding of inequality. Let me go through them fairly quickly. One is the idea of it was sometimes called Oaken's Law, who argued that, yes, you might want to have more equality, but if you did that, you'd have to give up in economic performance. And now we realize that equality and economic performance are actually complements. There's not a trade-off. There are many reasons for this. But I, what I want to emphasize is this is not a left-wing view. This has now become mainstream. Even the IMF has been st stressing the fact that inequality affects uh, 
economic performance, and they've been going around the world. I've been there, you know, with meetings with them where they tell governments all over the world that they have to address the problem of inequality because their concern is about growth and, and stability, and if you don't have, uh, if you have too much inequality, you'll get poor, ec poor economic growth and, and instability. So once you recognize the, the, the inequality that, that, equality, that equality and growth are complements, the argument that you sometimes hear that you can't afford to have more equality is absolutely wrong. Uh, in fact, it would help our economy. Uh, there are a couple essays that, that, that pick up this uh, uh, theme. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, way is I, I try to bring home the fact that we uh, can't afford to have more equality is after World War II, we were, in, you know, in 1945, we were a much poorer country than we were today. Seventy years ago, you know, there's been economic growth. We were actually, uh, uh, GDP now with the BRICS, we could think emerging markets, is larger than the GDP of the advanced countries today. So that shows you what's happened in, in 70 years. Well, when we in, ended World War II, our debt GDP ratio was 130 percent. And just to put this in perspective, when the Greece Greek crisis broke out, it had a debt GDP ratio of 110 percent. But at the end of World War II, we said we were going to provide free four-year education to the best college that anybody could get into for everybody who had fought in the war, which was all young men and many young women. We didn't say we couldn't afford it. What we said is we had to do it for our economy's sake, and for as a matter of social justice. So if we could afford it then, we could afford it tonight, today, and, and the same thing about UK today. Uh, the same thing, what we see is Scotland has decided to have free university education. Their income is the same roughly as England. And it's a choice, and they've made other choices, and one could debate about whether it's the right choice or the wrong choice, but these attempts to get greater equality are a matter of choice. But even poorer countries uh, have made different choices. Uh, one of the uh, fun things about being um, chief economist of the World Bank uh, is that you get to travel all over the world and see what's going on. And, uh, a few years ago, I went to uh, Mauritius, which is a small island, a small country off the east coast of Africa. Poor, but it's one of the fastest growing countries in Africa, and a country with a very strong social democratic commitment. And they provide four years of free college education to everybody who uh, it, 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 uh, can get into college. So if they can afford it, we can afford it. The issue is obviously it's not going to spend as much on, you know, they're not going to spend, have a $50,000 kind of college education that we charge at Columbia, but uh, they have to, you know, adjust it for their income. It's how you choose to spend your, your money. But if inequality is the result of policies, that must mean that it's going to be shaped by politics. And this is where we get into this very vicious circle that economic inequality gets inevitably translated into political inequality, and then that political inequality translates into rules of the game that create more economic inequality. And that is where the United States and uh, many other countries are today uh, mired. There are broad consequences of this. It's not only that it weakens the economy, it undermines democracy, it divides society, and this is especially so when the inequalities uh, are evident, uh, are, are uh, located along racial and ethnic lines. Uh, there's uh, one chapter in the book where I talk about some of the, 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 the political science literature which shows that when you have inequalities along those lines, you are more likely to have civil strife. And, uh, you know, I used to say, well, 
But we, we, of course, that, that's in the emerging markets in developing countries. But then I started thinking about Baltimore and Ferguson. And you start understanding that that helps under, uh, anybody understand what is happening in the United States. We are having our own form of civil strife uh, in city after city of the city because we have, in the United States, very divided country. Not, it's a great divide. Uh, not only of income, but that, that income is, is uh, that those divides have a very large ethnic and racial dimension to them. Of course, one of the reasons why, why this whole issue has risen to the top of the political agenda is that the nature of inequality in America, and this is true in, in many of the other advanced countries and European countries, is now really uh, making inaccessible what had been viewed as the basic tenets of a you might, you might call middle-class lifestyle. Um, uh, retirement security, education amongst children, uh, even the ability to own a home. Well, before concluding, uh, I, wanted to, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about how this interpretation differs from the interpretation that you had last week uh, of, uh, of Piketty. Um, besides the fact that it's shorter. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and uh, basically, his interpretation of the, you know, it, his, his analysis is a very rich analysis, and, and, and uh, much of what, uh, you know, I don't think he would disagree with most of what, I, what I've said, but he focuses on, on uh, a perspective that emphasizes the inherent nature of capitalism. And most of you know he, he, he talks about the return on capital exceeding the, re, the, re, the growth rate. The result of that is that uh, with capitalists saving uh, uh, their income, all their income, capitalist wealth uh, and income will increase relative to national income. Well, what I want to do is first spend just a few minutes uh, trying to explain uh, some of the makes all internal logic problems, the, the problems with, with, with the, the uh, construction of uh, the, the theoretical model that ought to lie behind the, those assertions. Um, those of you who want to, want to uh, read, read about this more, you can go back to my 1969 paper or uh, a, a, great, a further elaboration in, in a paper that will be coming out at the Roosevelt Institute and the NBR. So, uh, what matters is not just the rate of return on capital, but the rate of return times the savings rate. Obviously, if they weren't saving any of their income, it wouldn't compound. And so the compounding is determined not by the, just the rate of return, but the product, the rate of return, and the savings rate. And in most of the standard models, the product, SR, is actually less than G. So you go back to the, the classic uh, growth model of Solo. Uh, you can show that in Solo's growth model, in the long run, SR is always going to be less than G. There's another uh, fundamental problem, which is that in any coherent model, the return on capital uh, has to be endogenous. There needs to be what, we, what I call macro and micro consistency. The behavior of the individuals has to add up to the behavior of the macro economy. And if it were the case that what he calls wealth was the same as the capital stock. And I'll come back to try to elaborate on what this means. If they were, if W and K were the same, then the law of diminishing returns, which is one of the most strongly held laws in economics, would imply that the rate of return on capital would have to fall. And it would continue to fall until that inequality was no longer, the inequality that he posits would no longer be true. But also something else would be going on. If you would have capital deepening, there's more and more capital, then wages ought to be rising. Again, one of the most, you know, uh, deepest beliefs in, in economics is capital deepening ought to lead to a rise in wages. This is true even if you have skill bias technical change, you can show that there, and, and in this paper that I, I, I mentioned, uh, there, there's a, 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 a very general aggregation theorem that says 
that the average wage, you know, add together skilled and unskilled workers, the average wage would have to rise. But that's not what's been happening. If you look, in fact, at the average, if you look at what's happening to wages, and you, you, uh, you take, uh, um, uh, they've been stagnating. And in fact, there's a, you can't explain one of the most curious phenomena that has opened up in the last 30, third of a century, and that is, while productivity has been increasing, wages have not. That is to say, look at the last, say, third of a century in the United States, productivity has roughly doubled. But wages have stagnated. Now, you can go through, uh, if you were a committed neoclassical economist, you could go through some uh, arcane, Ptolemaic exercise of trying to explain deviations between the average and marginal productivity uh, that might be able to reconcile these facts, but uh, it would be just a Ptolemaic exercise. I don't think you'd find any plausible story of how it could be that uh, average productivity has doubled and no wage increase in a competitive market. But of course, what I emphasized earlier, it's not clear that we really have the competitive market uh, uh, and there could have been significant increases in market power in the last third of a century, and I believe there have been. There are some more uh, uh, Puzzles. Um, you can only explain about one half to three fourths of the growth in wealth, the wealth income ratio, by national savings. So when we talk about savings, as people, you know, are in the back of our mind, we have something like a primitive agriculture economy. You you grow your seed, and then every year you eat some of it, and some of it you plant back, and over time you get more and more capital accumulated. You know, so so savings is not consuming. Well, we have data on savings out of national income. And when you look at that data, you simply cannot explain the increase in the wealth income ratio if you interpret wealth as capital. In fact, you can only explain about a half to three fourths. Well, the unexplained part, which I sometimes call the wealth residual, I believe is best explained very simply. It's a growth of ranks. There are all kinds of ranks. Land ranks, exploitation ranks, intellectual property ranks. The failure to include that, those ranks, to include land, to include monopoly power, was, I think, uh, you know, as I look back in my 1969 paper, that was the big mistake in my paper. Um, and that's what I've tried to correct. Uh, in, in my ongoing work. Um, and these factors can, can go a long way to explaining not only, not only uh, uh, the wealth residual, but also the other puzzles that I talked about and the, 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 the uh, puzzles uh, that are thrown up by uh, what has happened. Um, uh, uh, so once you recognize that wealth is not just capital, it's not just the stock of productive assets, but includes the value of land, the capitalized value of exploitation ranks. What do I mean by exploitation ranks? Monopoly power, uh, all kinds of ranks in our economy. Um, it's the capitalized value. and so you shouldn't think about wealth and capital as the same idea. Same idea. And that's really the fundamental mistake that Piketty, uh, 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 in Piketty's analysis. He tries to equate the two. And one can be going up when the other is going down. So in fact, we've looked at data based on OECD and uh, for m many countries uh, and what we see is that even though the wealth income ratio is going up, the capital income ratio is going down. 
Uh, the two are moving in opposite ways. In fact, many of the sources of increasing wealth that are associated with ranks actually lead to decreased productivity. Let me just give you two examples that try to bring the point home. One of them is if monopoly power gets larger, that's a larger distortion in the economy, but the capitalized value of those ranks will go up as an increase in rents, and people will be the economy will actually be worse off, so even though wealth is going up. Take another example. If the banks succeed in convincing Congress, uh, convincing, that is to say bribe Congress, to <laughs> give them bigger bailout rents, the capitalized value of those bailout rents will show up in the share value of the, of the banks. So wealth of the economy goes up as we measure it. But the wealth of taxpayers, which is not included in the data, goes down because we will be paying the bailout. It's just a transfer from taxpayers to the corporations. We measure the corporations. We don't measure the, the negative side. So all of that means that uh, uh, wealth and capital can move in different directions. Of course, we then have to explain what goes, uh, what is the sources of ranks, why ranks have gone up, why exploitation ranks, why land ranks have gone up, there are lots of, uh, of that. I don't have time to do that. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that when we start thinking about that, we realize that monetary policy and financial policy can increase the value of land ranks. And that's what we've seen in QE. QE, lower interest rates, and liberalization of financial markets can give rise to a bubble in, in land values. Is an increase in land values a wealthier country? If the price of land in Southampton, which is where a lot of the billionaires live, uh, have summer homes in, in, uh, in the United States, or the, or the Riviera. That goes up. The country isn't richer. It's the same amount of land that we had before, but the wealth goes up. In fact, you can argue as wealth goes into land, there's less wealth to invest in productive assets. So the bottom line is that monetary policy, financial policy, actually is a major source of the increase in land ranks and uh, a major reason for the increase in inequality. And then as we start thinking about it this way, we realize the key distinction is not so much between debtors and creditors, but between life cycle savers and inherited wealth. They have very large differences in portfolio composition, which is one of the reasons why QE has played such a role in uh, increasing inequality. Um, well, let me just conclude. Uh, to me, there are three basic uh, important conclusions that come out of this kind of analysis uh, out of my book, The Great Divide. The first is that incremental changes will not suffice. We need a comprehensive agenda which will significantly reduce inequality and increase equality of opportunity. And uh, there is that kind of comprehensive agenda. There's no magic bullet, but there are lots of things together that will make a difference. The second th thing is a, a note of urgency. Decisions today will affect inequality decades later, just like the decisions made a third of a century ago have cumulatively led to where we are today. And the final point is, the real question is not economics. You know, if, if they left it to me, I could solve this problem. <laughs> the real question is the politics and whether the vicious circle that I talked about, the, the role of money in politics will allow us now to change course and try to create uh, a fairer and uh, more equal society and an economy that will perform better. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for an enormously appreciated lecture for covering so much ground. Um, we do have um, 20 minutes um, for question and answer. Um,
Could I ask you, there are a lot of you in the hall. I imagine that a lot of you may want to ask questions. So could you make your questions brief? And could you avoid them being a long manifesto? Um, could, you, could you say who you are and roughly where you're from, from the LSE or, um, um, or, or from elsewhere? Um, and I'll take questions in groups of three. There are roving microphones. Um, this is being recorded and will be podcast, so if you wouldn't mind waiting until the microphone um, reaches you. So I've got a first question just here, um, a second question there in blue, and a third question at the back, um, right at the back of the gallery at the top there. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Hi, thank you for such an amazing talk. I can get your share on Twitter. Uh, if you want to see major changes, would it be not would it be interesting not to sell capitalism, capitalism as an economic model, but as a global machine of total repression through the medium of poverty? And would this not also explain why the poor get poorer and the self-titled elite get richer? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Ryo Takahashi from the University of Tokyo. Uh, my question is, how do we realistically wrest some of that uh, collected political and economic capital amongst so few without, uh, or, or by overcoming the anticipated backlash of, uh, of those few? Thank you. And then the gentleman right at the back of the gallery. Uh, thanks. Gerardo Mendoza from LSE student. Um, does the growth of inequality, it's allowing and growing spaces for the civil society meaning NGO, and coming from Mexico, where we, some people proud that we have the richest men of the world, and some people start to question that, and you find the conclusions where it's politics, how do you govern a country where you have this bargaining power on the business sector, and you don't have clearly a strong state that can balance that power? Okay, so those are three really easy, small questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, let, let, let me begin on a hopeful note uh, 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 on Mexico, uh, and I think it has to do with the strength of civil society, uh, uh, voter engagement. Um, the interesting thing is that while uh, the issue of increasing competition, particularly in telecom, for those of you who know, don't know, Carl Slim it was the monopolist in, in the uh, telephone sector. Uh, it, uh, he, he, uh, his wealth is based not just on exercising uh, market power in one market, but in many markets. So, so uh, but uh, I engaged actually in a debate with him almost 10 years ago on uh, uh, trying to, uh, whether there should be a change in competition policy in telecom. And uh, um, the good news is after about 10 years of public debate, a lot of pressure, they passed a new telecom bill that is creating new competition. And uh, the interesting thing is, is how people reframe. Uh, so I was with his son uh, a, a week ago. And uh, his son pointed, oh, this is great. This new competition is really going to spur us on. And we're going uh, to even do better. So. What, what, what is interesting is, uh, somebody's trying to drown this out, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think what is, and I, I think there was some truth in that. I, I think that they, at, at that point, have said, uh, we do really have to have more competition in our economy. So it was a combination of civil society, a, a waking up to what, what needed to be done and uh, a, a, a government that was a little bit more dynamic than, previ than somewhat more dynamic than previous governments, and, and it happened. So uh, to me, that represents actually a, a really startling outcome, because it was one person who had an enormous amount of, uh, you might say, uh, obviously money, but also political power, and the system was able to, uh, was able to change. And it is testimony to the importance of, uh, of, of civil society, I think, in these, in these battles. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, when I wrote, when we wrote this report, uh, this was not just an academic report. It was written, uh, it was written through the Roosevelt Institute, which is uh, um, a think tank associated, every one of the presidents uh, to, has their own library, and part associated with the library is often a think tank. 
Uh, this particular think tank, the Rose, is, is uh, uh, related to Franklin uh, Roosevelt. Um, you might think, you know, obviously a little bit left of center uh, perspective on things. Uh, but this is actually a, a, a one where we've engaged uh, not only uh, Congress, we had, uh, when we issued it, we had a, meetings with both the Senate and the House of Representatives to try to explain that we had massive ma uh, press coverage. Um, and so, you know, fairly well organized. But we have a campus network uh, throughout the United States. We have more than 10,000 students engaged in political activity. So it's part of our attempt to try to get these messages, uh, to get students engaged and to create the next generation of active civil society and, and to try to uh, bring these uh, issues uh, to the fore. Um, the, um, the second question about uh, backlash and, and uh, um, uh, how could uh, they continue pushing the extremes of inequality. The interesting thing, if you go back even to Adam Smith, he talks about self-interest rightly understood. That he had the view that people ought to understand that it is not in their self-interest to create a too divided society. And the interesting thing is there are many members of the 1% who understand that. It's also interesting that there are many who don't. And, and that's really a lot of what we're trying to do is because you, we recognize, you know, that we have a political system in which money, you know, I, I, I've said, you know, uh, Americans, political system is better described as one dollar, one vote, than one person, one vote. Uh, one has to deal with that reality, but part of what we're doing is to try to make people understand uh, people in the one percent that it's not in their self-interest to create a society in which we have these huge divides, where we have this kind of backlash, where we have riots in Baltimore, and uh, uh, I think there's a growing understanding of that. I don't want to say it's universal. We, you know, it, it is a political fight, and we know that. And but w what is interesting is how many people are beginning to to understand. Uh, the, the kind of tenets that I try to put forward. Uh, and one of the reasons I wrote the book, <laughs> quite honestly. And it's one of the reasons I, I didn't mention, you know, I, I wrote the, you know, my first Vanity Fair article, but after that article came out, I was asked by the New York Times to curate a series called The Great Divide, uh, which is from which the, the title of this book. And we had articles in the New York Times on a regular basis, basically more than once a week. I didn't write all of them, but that, that kept bringing out the many dimensions of inequality so that there was an increasing awareness of the nature of inequality. So, you know, it, this won't happen on its own, this, this kind of realization, and it won't happen just from an ivory tower. There has to be some engagement. Um, and, and fortunately, you know, we were, a, you know, I, I was lucky to be able to, 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 to have interactions with people in New York Times, Vanity Fair, and to try to get these messages, uh, messages out. Um, the question about what is the basic nature of capitalism and it is really a, a deep and, I don't, uh, uh, and a complicated question. What I want to emphasize, and I don't use the word capitalism too much, uh, what I really want to talk about is market economies. And, uh, there are a couple points. Market economies don't exist in a vacuum. Some people on the right have the view that market economies just, there are some God-given rules of market economies, and, and they don't. We, we structure a market economy, and how we structure, the rules that we put down, determine how those market economies perform. They determine the degree of inequality in our society, and they also determine the efficiency of our economy in, in many different ways. So uh, what is true is that a lot of the battle over, over um, inequality today is over how those rules get made and who makes those rules. 
And that's the real danger of globalization in my mind. The, the real danger, and that's why the big debate we're having in the United States, and I hope you're having in Europe, is the extent to which there is a seeding of power uh, about making the rules to some abstract trade agreement, abs you know, some, some international body that is not democratically accountable. So, and let me make it clear, this is not an accident. You know, it was not an accident that, that in the 1980s there was this idea that monetary policy should not be politically accountable. You know, people said we want an independent monetary policy that would pursue a focus just on inflation. That, that was a political agenda. And so an economist, many of whom are re seemingly respectable, um, <laughs> became victim of this political process. <laughs> And some of you may have suffered and read some articles uh, uh, in, in that, or even written some of the articles in that vein. Uh, but let me, to bring that home, when uh, I was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, one of the Republicans wanted to, the, 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 officially the Federal Reserve has a mandate of inflation, but also growth, and most importantly, unemployment. And now also financial stability, okay? And one of the uh, Republican congressmen wanted to change the mandate to focus just on inflation. And, you know, he was citing people, we won't mention their names, from University of Chicago who said, you know, that's the right economic model. So I said to President Clinton, let's make that a campaign issue. Do the American people want a monetary policy that, foc that cares about unemployment? And as soon as President Clinton said, yeah, we're willing to fight on that issue. The Republicans said, no, we're not interested <laughs> in fighting on that issue, because they know what the outcome would be. So it was so clear that this was a political issue. The mandate of the Fed is a political issue, and yet economists have tried to, but, so try, people have tried to use that and move it out of the politics. So that's where, where the, you know, in my mind, um, uh, a focus on trying to understand how moving rules about intellectual property, uh, uh, capital, uh, uh, financial regulation out of the democratic process, uh, even if there's a, ultimately, you have to pass a, 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 a vote for a treaty. The fact is that the kind of detailed democratic debate isn't there, and they don't want that, because if there were, they would reject most of those provisions. Thank you. Let's take one more round. I've got Robert Wade was in first, in the front there, and then Ellen just two along. And then Thanks, Joe. Um, you showed that um, over the past 30 years, wages have been more or less stagnant, um, while income gains have been concentrated at the top. So one might expect that um, surveys of happiness would show rising frequency of unhappiness in the population as a whole, but actually that's not the case. Um, the surveys show that the, uh, the, the, the American population has become more happy even as the gap between them and the top has uh, increased. So the question is how might you explain that? No, could you put, just pass it? Uh, too long. Okay, and then I'll take the lady. Uh, uh, Ellen Halsworth from the London School of Economics. My question is, what is your definition of politics? Because you've talked a lot about the economic side of it, and a lot of times when you talk about policies, they seem to be economic policies. And uh, I think this is of interest to people in this country. There are a lot of other debates going on around inequality, for example, human rights, and what are the rights that we have, and how is that um, part of our politics and policy. So I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about how these other types of politics would contribute to the phenomenon that you've talked to. Thank you. Uh, could you get the uh, microphone to, there's a lady at the back there in a white shirt. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, I'm Luce. I work for Delayed Gratification, a slow journalism magazine. 
Um, I'm <clears throat> interested in how the way that we measure economic output affects uh, how we manage our policy. And I think in 2009, you were part of a commission to come up with a more inclusive or representative number than the GDP. So my question is, what are the shortcomings of the GDP and how does it misguide policy? Okay, uh, good, good questions. Again, not easy. Um, and the last question and the first question are, are, are somewhat uh, related. Um, Robert Kennedy famously uh, said that uh, GDP measures uh, everything except what's important in life. And, and uh, uh, when GDP was first formulated, it was just a measure of economic activity. And it, over time, has become a measure, taken to be a measure of well-being. Actually, increasingly, it's a poor measure of both. Uh, because in terms of economic activity, a large part of GDP is imputed, just numbers that are made up uh, that, that uh, we don't measure very well. So there's a whole set of, you know, you just say, you know, how do we measure government services? How do we measure housing services? Uh, we don't do that very well. And then we don't measure lots of things like uh, leisure activities. We don't measure insecurity. Uh, so those are important aspects of well-being that are not brought in to, to our metrics. So um, uh, this is really important because what we measure really does affect what we do. So the government says, oh, this reform is going to lead to more growth. What they really mean is more measure growth by GDP. <laughs> but if that reform actually led to more insecurity, worse environment, uh, well-being will go down. And one of the things we've emphasized, you know, once you start thinking about inequality, is, uh, you know, I've said GDP in the United States is a terrible measure of how well our economy is doing because in terms of what the experience of most individuals, say the median income, has stagnated for a quarter of a century. That's a far better measure of how well our economy is doing than GDP. We ought to, you know, the, 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 uh, the president, the, uh, the campaign ought to be saying, something's wrong with our economy. Nothing's been delivered for most Americans for a quarter of a century. But they don't do that. They focus on GDP. So uh, this is, uh, that's why the, these are very, not only important in assessing how well we're doing, very important in assessing trade-offs on, on whether we sh better to have an environmental policy. One of the critiques, cr criticism of better environmental policy, it'll cost us in GDP. That's only because we're not measuring performance in the right way. So um, that's why these issues, I, I think, are, are really uh, important. And there's a continuing agenda going on. Um, uh, at the OECD, uh, the, 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 uh, part of this is in the, what they call the Better Living Index, where they're trying to talk about how what really makes for better living, for, for better standards of living. Um, and we have, there's something called a high-level expert group where we're trying to re-examine, continuing the examination of, of, of the GDP indicators. Um, Robert's question about uh, unhappiness, one part of our, our uh, uh, work at the International Commission was try to incorporate results about perceptions of well-being. It was the most controversial aspect, partly because we, we don't, there is something in these surveys because they're replicable, they're very hard to compare over time or, or over uh, across countries. Some countries, are, you know, you look at, at, at them, and you know, France is a country, you know, we love to visit France, you know, they, they, there's a kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful place to visit. The French are chronically unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we, we envy their five weeks, six weeks of vacation. And we say, you know, shouldn't that make you happy? And they say, yes, it is, it's really important but somehow it doesn't show up in their uh, happiness uh, surveys. Uh, I just think, you know, Americans are chronically optimistic. You know, uh, they're, 
uh, you know, uh, they've just gone bankrupt. Uh, <laughs> they've, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody's dying in the family, you know, uh, they're sick. And you ask them, how do you feel? They say, oh, you know, never been better. And, <laughs> and, and what they'll say is, you know, uh, or they'll say, it could be worse. <laughs> you know, then, you know, we'll get through this and uh, it, we'll learn from the experience. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, uh, maybe there is redemption through suffering, but, but uh, 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 I think it's a characteristic of them want, you know, they see things aren't very good and they want to feel that they're not at the bottom of the heap. Uh, nobody wants to feel, you know, there's a, a famous uh, radio program uh, in the next, United States called Lake Wobegon. And, you know, and the, it always begins, it, 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 uh, uh, like someplace in Minnesota, I believe. Uh, and the defining characteristic of this uh, town in Lake Wobegon is everybody in this village is in the top half. <laughs> so um, that's just the characteristic. You know, they, they're all in the top half of the class. They're all healthier than everybody else. And if, if that's always true, you know, with maybe an aberration here and there, uh, their perceptions are, uh, let's say, out of sync with reality. And uh, you see that in so many ways. It actually has a very difficult play, uh, imp impact on, on, on our politics. Most Americans supported, there was a survey, supported the repeal of the inheritance tax, the state tax. You don't pay estate taxes until, if you're a married couple, until your income, your, your bequest is more than $10 million. And, uh, you know, there are only a few hundred people that pay estate taxes a year. You know, I think it's under a thousand. Anyway, it's not a lot of people. I wish more Americans had to worry about it. But most Americans are worried that they will wind up and win the lottery <laughs> and have this difficult problem of having to pay this estate tax on their, in, on their bequest of over $10 million. You know, God bless them. I, I hope that happens, but the likelihood of this, so, you know, they're all there knowing that they're going to win the lottery. So that, that and, and that makes you happy. If you know you're going to win the lottery, you should be happy uh, if you have that inside track. Now, the final question, uh, Pastor. Fairly quickly. Fairly quickly, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was the hardest question. <laughs> um, it, it was about uh, what about rights and, and how does that fit in to the analysis? You know, obviously I focused on economic policies, but the distinction between the two uh, are not very clear. Like what I talked about is power in many aspects. Um, equal, you know, gender equality is an aspect of rights, and it's an economic issue. The right to medical care, health care. Many people think, you know, it's, it's in the Declaration of Human Rights. But the United States signed that Declaration of Human Rights, but did, still doesn't recognize it. So you can say it's a human right. I'm saying it's, it has a big effect on how, of the nature of inequality, and it has an effect on how our economy performs. Um, Little things like family leave policy. Are, what, are they rights or are they economic policies? Uh, rights to collective action. You know, the ILO basic rights. The United States has tried to undermine those rights. And it even goes to political rights. I mean, the, uh, there, there has been a systematic onslaught in the United States on the right to vote. You might say, well, aren't you a democracy where everybody has the right to vote? The answer is no. <laughs> that there is a real attempt to make it more difficult for poor people to register to vote and to vote. And so, you know, if you know, if you're a Republican and you know that it's more likely that poor people are going to vote Democratic, an important part of your agenda is to make sure that poor people don't vote. And 
And um, there are some people who go further. For instance, uh, you know, I, I talked about criminal, uh, about inequalities and justice. The United States has a mass incarceration program. We have 5% of the world's population, 25% of the people in prison in the world. And if you're convicted of a felony, you can't vote. And large fractions of African Americans have been convicted and can't vote. So this is, and there's been a, you know, a very powerful book called Jim Crow. It's a, I think it's a deliberate attempt to deprive people of rights and part of the agenda of creating inequality. It's all about the rules. And, that's, and, and whether you do talk about it as economic rules or political rules, what they are doing is shaping inequality in America. And unfortunately, we're exporting. This is one of our export products, is many of these ideas. And uh, unfortunately, uh, too many people come to America to study economics. And they come back believing in Chicago economics. And uh, so there is not only a political battle, there's also an intellectual battle that has to be fought. Thank you very much. Um, could, I, could I just make... Uh, uh, could I just make two announcements? Um, the first announcement is that I said at the beginning, um, Joe will very kindly, uh, for a few minutes, be signing copies of his book, if any of you would like that. The second is to say that while we've been talking, I'm told, um, U.S. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew has been confirmed to be speaking on the morning of Wednesday, the 27th of May. So some of you may well be interested in that. The details will be on the LSE website tomorrow. But again, could I thank you very much for our much greater than average level of enjoyment. Thank you.